Hello everyone, we hope you're all doing very well. Today we have an extremely exciting day. Now, as you're probably aware, it is really difficult to get developers, uh, DCS developers, on to talk about stuff, and that's because they're really busy, and let's face it, they've got better things to do than sit and talk to dumbasses like us. But we've managed to get a uh, Polychop on. We've got Sven and Dan from Polychop. Say hello, guys. Hello, community. Hello. <laughs> I hope you're all doing well. So hey, that's my line, Sven. That's then. my line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and the other guy is Dan. So. Right, well, Dan from, uh, from Holland, and we've got um, uh, Sven from Germany. So, yeah, very much appreciated for them to take their time and do this because we know they're very busy. So we're going to chop on. Uh, so the first thing is we've got some questions. As ever, we let you guys ask anything you want to ask of them. So we've got our public questions. Uh, we've got the gazelle and any miscellaneous stuff. And then we've got questions from Polychop about the queue up. I should probably explain before that how, well, kind of why we, we managed to get them on. And that's because uh, we'll start with the gazelle. Um, so, well, the, the first thing to say is we've got much more into helicopters, which is why this is more relevant now, in Grim Reapers. We've got a whole subgroup of Grim Reapers called Grav, G-R-A-V, who's led, well, technically by another guy, but let's just say Iron Wolf today because Iron Wolf's online. Um, and we've literally, every mission, I, I, you guys probably don't have time to follow us, but we, every mission now we have nearly 20 helicopter pilots that turn up. Uh, flying all of the helicopters, including the gazelles. And that's why um, helicopters are much more important, especially the new one that's coming out for us at the moment. I don't really get to fly them, but, you know, it is still very important for us. Um, and the reason we re reached out to Sven, or I think it was actually the other way around, is that I did a review on the Gazelle. Uh, I do I review all the um, uh, aircraft in DCS, and as you all know, I'm not, you know, I'm not qualified, I'm not a pilot and whatnot. I just do it as a gamer and how I feel about them. Um, try and keep as fair as possible. Uh, you can see my review down here of the Gazelle uh, for the visuals, uh, 4.5, which is about as good as it gets, maybe just slightly down from the Tomcat. So I was really chuffed by the visuals inside and outside. Sound effects, 3.5, you know, just perfectly normal, good, fine. Interactivity in detail, you know, how I can interact with the cockpit, the systems I can mess with, the feel about the kind of how they've modeled the systems behind uh, the graphics, 4 out of 10, I put, you know, really good. The only thing it fell down was the flight model. For me, personally, I never got on with the Gazelle flight model. And it's really like, I don't know if you guys know what this means, but it's really like Marmite. In England, that means that you either love it or you hate it, the flight model. I'm unfortunately one of the haters. I never got on with the Gazelle flight model. Um, and the reason is, for me, that it just never felt immersive to me. Um, and I could compare that directly against the Huey, the Mi8, and the um, uh, the other guy, the uh, Ka50, which I always got on with. It felt immersive, but the Gazelle I never got on with. And we've kind of got this 50-50 split down the whole of GR. 50% um, of them really like it. I don't know what side RC and Iron Wolf are on. I've never actually asked them. And then 50% don't like it, like me. And of course, same with the fans as well, really. And it's always been a kind of talking point. And, um, and I was talking about that and I was basically slagging it off on the internet and, and Sven called me up on it and that's how we got here. So if we just talk a little bit about that first and your thoughts on that and then we can move on to the questions. Um, does anyone want to kick off with that about the, the Gazelle flight model? Um, just you guys go ahead. And, um, hey, what did Iron Wolf and RC? Give me, just give me your honest thoughts about it. No, I can I can start with that if you, if, yes, if you like. Yes, send down. Uh, you know, to be to be honest, uh, with with helicopters, and uh, you say you compare it to to the other ones, yeah, that are clearly more heavier mm. uh, than the Gazelle. And <clears throat> well, you know, it's 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 tough. Uh, we know it can be better, and we know that because of the the Kiowa project mm. that uses a whole new system for the flight model. And um, but but even um, the Gazelle pilots we're talking to now that are involved in the, the, the overhaul of the Gazelle project. Mm. Uh, they don't agree on anything, uh, even with each other. Uh, some like this, yeah. like it the way it is, <laughs> with some exceptions, because we all know there are some uh, maneuvers you can do outside of the real flight you know, envelope, mm. and, and that will be fixed in the future. Uh, but it's, you know, and I think Sven has said it before, but if you talk to 10 pilots, 10 helicopter pilots about a flight model, you will get 10 different opinions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, but, you know, yeah. I just want to say, 
uh, we know some things can be better on the flight model and uh, with, with the new system that is used for the, for the Kiowa that will be ported over to the Gazelle, you will okay. see improvements. Copy. <clears throat> May I link in here? Um, so um, what we can address, or not what we can address, but what we have found for ourselves and what we knew at some point was uh, the biggest issues for, for the the player itself was not the general physics of the flight model it was more the feel on yeah, the cycle that's it. that was the problem and that's actually the what we had um not enough information about um so we had to work uh in the beginning um with pilots um at some point when the project was already running so um that um actually kind of like goes a little bit back into um kind of like one of the user questions um, partially scratches that what I want to or what I can give uh, as information. Um, the whole Gazelle project was actually just uh, at the beginning an experiment um, by Patrick. Um, and um, so he did it as a mod as everybody can research on the forums. And by then it was not intended to be a full blown module. Mm -hmm. um, short, short or long story short, we were working on a different project by then when we met, uh, that was an F-18 Super Hornet um, by Cortex Design and uh, the whole team split up. So basically we decided, okay, what can we do? Um, who wants to stay uh, as a group and what do we push forward? So we had the gazelle then in focus because we knew there is something already done. So how far can we bring this? So it was our first module. And <clears throat> during the process, I guess like, a year into making the mod, <clears throat> sorry, um, there were the first people in the French forums actually noticing what was going on. And then step by step, some pilots dropped in and um, started to give Patrick and us some information. And um, yeah, <clears throat> over the course of time, we had um, a few guys being able to test it. Um, and um, we even were then contacted by the French um, training center in Pau, basically Le Luc. Um, and they received six copies from us uh, after release. And we talked to them, but the communication there is a bit more um, not complicated, but they got a lot more stuff to do in, in their terms better stuff to do than mm -hmm. just talking to us about like hey how does it fly how does it feel so they used to basically for um the vvn system um training and uh that's what they used it for mm -hmm. um matter of fact is um a friend of mine he is now flying for with special forces he had um um reviewed the whole thing in 2017 he was flying it we recorded the flight um and he was giving inputs um on what should change and um how it should change matter of fact is in the end um what happened was we never had access to actual position um, data of the cyclic so we had to come up with something that was good enough for the pilots that were testing it and in the end um they even told us that it's even better than the simulator that they have for trainings in their bases, which was weird for me to hear that. But I saw a video of this, um, the actual simulator on, on the French um, base where he was located at by then. Um, and um, so we were at this position at a point where we had to say, okay, what do the pilots tell us? And we had, I think by then, three pilots that were actually working with us. Like my friend who was working with us partially when he had time and was not on um, some mission somewhere. Um, and then two other guys that were working with Patrick. And we had there again, three different opinions. Um, some people were telling us, yeah, this is good how it is um, out of this group. Then there was another British guy that actually I got uh, contact to who uh, had over four and a half thousand hours on the British Gazelle and was an instructor. And he was actually also on that point where he said, hey, this is like a part where you can um, make it better. But overall, it feels very close to the actual aircraft. So we were like, okay, people are complaining on the, on the net. Then we have the other side of the coin that there are people that actually were flying the aircraft and um, what should we do? So we were kind of in the middle. So we were like, okay, whom, whom do we trust more? And that was the dilemma that we had over the course of time. Matter of fact is um, the biggest problem for the gamer is that the cyclic does not feel natural, yeah. which is going back to the point that we don't have the actual position data of the cyclic in certain flight regimes, which 
we actually were lucky to get for the other aircraft. So um, this is the biggest issue, I would say, in the flight model itself. Mm -hmm. The other stuff, this extreme stuff, like flying inverted or stuff like that, um, I know that the, that the Gazelle can fly perfect barrel rolls or loops. It can do that. I have seen pictures of that. I received from the British guy, for example, pictures where he was going upside down in a roll over German airspace when he was in the 80s here mm -hmm. stationed. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. Um, and the altitude was fairly low. Um, and so, but in general, if you fly the Gazelle in a normal regime, and don't overdo it like in, in certain things like you want to pull some stunt that normally you would never do in a helicopter she feels very solid to the people that actually flew the aircraft mm -hmm. with that input Roger. yes so um yeah um, yeah just just want to add to that uh, we're in the process of getting the, the uh, cyclic data uh we were missing in the past so more job, yeah. Um, and for me, did you? Sorry, did you want to come in there, Imo? Um, all I wanted to say was that for me, like I don't, I've never flown a helicopter, a real helicopter. Um, and for me, uh, it feels like a helicopter of that weight, with that power, with that rotor system should feel like. So I, I don't have any complaints about it. Um, yes, it is wildly different to a, a Huey, but. It's a completely different rotor system, heavier helicopter. It's already been said. Mm. Um, it should feel different. Uh, it'll be, it'd be strange if it didn't. Mm. Such a light helicopter versus such a heavy one. Mm. I think I've got one more thing to add there. Personally, and this is this is not really based on any evidence. I personally get the feeling that DCS, the the the, the physics engine behind everything. Um, I personally don't think it's set up very well for lightweight aircraft. The, the, like I said, the only two modules I've got a problem with in or should I maybe it's better to say that I don't like the feel of are the gazelle and the Christian Eagle the Christian Eagle in terms of role authority to me me feels I lose all my immersion and I got um, a letter from Nick Gray um, and said some other guys saying well that's exactly how it feels I can tell you because I've got the one in my backyard um, mm -hmm. so basically the same thing as the, what the gazelle pilots are saying you know that is how it is it's something to do personally i think it's something to do with the behind the scenes stuff in dcs it doesn't just you know it loves big 15 ton hornets it just doesn't seem to support very well lightweight aircraft and the the feedback because uh, i'm personally very sensitive to the feel of these different aircraft that's how i fly everything uh, and that's my kind of synopsis of it i have uh, um guess to why this is that way in dcs most aircraft as you already described are heavy aircraft mm. um, we're talking of 15 20 or even sometimes 30 tons um, and even the helicopters there are like five tons upwards so um the, the the player basically is used to more heavyweight aircrafts and um about the christian eagle for example i have it myself as well um on first try it felt weird but one of our um like alpha testers our pilots he also flies privately normal aircrafts not just helicopters for the military and he actually told me hey it feels very accurate there's mm. an area where it kind of like departs a little bit early mm. but i asked him how do you know and he he was actually stating the same thing that nick gray is stating because he had some time in the christian eagle he was lucky to be um able to do some acrobatics in it so um i think it's just that the general player is not used mm. to such a lightweight aircraft i mean what does the christian eagle weigh yeah 800 900 kilograms it's not much or maybe yeah. a, or more importantly what, what you said to me is that the wings weigh uh, it's either 70 kilos or 70 pounds either way those wings weigh basically nothing so there's no yep. i don't know what the words are but you know what i mean there's no there's no mm, inertia to kind of pull it round like you would if it was a big heavy plane so mm. mm-hmm Okay. Um, anyone? Uh, so that's our first point kind of covered. Anyone want to add anything to that before we move on to the viewer questions? Okay, guys. Very good. Right, let's move on to the viewer questions. First of all, the Gazelle and Miscellaneous. So first of all, we've got some easy ones by the look, looks of it. So in, in the cleanest config you can get with the best uh, scenario, do we know the Gazelle's official top speed? I know you could look this up on Wikipedia and whatnot. I just like speaking to the guys, or at least the DCS's Gazelle's top speed. Um, on the Gazelle top speed, you have to 
differentiate between the versions. So the 3RD2 mic has a redesigned blade, which has more lift power, but in terms of getting more lift power, they had to reduce the, 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 the high speed um, regime. So you're sacrificing somewhere always if you change the design. Mm -hmm. So basically um, the Gazelle uh, 342M has uh, roughly 240 kilometers top speed. Uh, the VE, we're talking about the VE, never uh, velocity never exceed. Mm -hmm. um, and the L and the Lima, they sh have roughly around 300 something. That was actually what they were designed for. Because it was back then when it was designed and put on the market, um, it was the fastest helicopter that was around worldwide. So it had many records in that time. Um, but that's the old blade. I think the 341 Lima that went into service then later on the French army that had a redesign as well. So I would have to look up the top speeds there, um, what the actual aircraft has in real life. Are those differences in the mic modeled in DTS then? Partially, partially, because the flight model is actually, um, the mic and the Lima share the same flight model, but um, the Lima has some uh, adjustments so that it can fly a little faster than the, the mic. Roger, did you notice that I'm all five? Never noticed that. I think the top speed in, on the Lima and DCS is right now roughly 270, 275, somewhere in Berlin, between there. Yeah, it's quite far. Hmm, okay, very good, guys. Uh, where did you get access to? So, presumably, to get, I don't know how you model a, a real aircraft, but presumably it starts with getting access to a plane in a hangar and you turn up with a camera and just start taking photos. How did you and where did you get access to these choppers? Um, in terms of 3D, um, that's actually my department. You don't have to have access to a real aircraft. What you need is blueprints and you need uh, good photographs. And other than that, um, you have to have a very good eye for detail and basically you have to know what you do in 3D and have a good feeling for that. So it takes practice, experience of a long short of uh, long term of time. And um, so you necessary or you don't necessarily need access to a real aircraft. It's nice to have access to the real aircraft because you can do measurements um, that or certain objects where you know, okay, this is some uh, very important point that I need, for example, in terms of modeling the cockpit, I can take my measurements of certain gauges, have them as my reference, and then go from there. Um, the best case is actually um, 3D scanning an aircraft, but that's uh, a whole different ball game in terms of um, effort, um, being able mm. to have access to the aircraft. Mm. And in the end, um, not every military is that open to mm. give you mm. access to the aircraft. So for the Gazelle, we didn't have any access to the rear aircraft. On the Kiowa, that's a little different. Um, I was actually invited by a squadron already, um, mm. but I have not made the jump yet to fly that, to that squadron. So um, yeah. but still there um there was no real aircraft um in front of me that i needed to see but some people took some measurements on the rear aircraft for me um as a reference awesome. so that's a very yeah. so very briefly how did you so you built this thing basically from from the official blueprint so how the hell does that work do you like make each little piece in 3d or do you i really can't even imagine how you do this <laughs> Well, in short, is there is no official blueprint on any aircraft out there. All blueprints that you find um, on the internet, they're all changed in a certain on certain areas. Um, the only people or the only um, available reference blueprints that are accurate will be on the manufacturer side. Um, and so you have to have a good measurement um, and a good eye for detail from pictures to compare the blueprints. Are they correct or not? Um, so for the Kiowa, I used three different blueprints and um, measured basically then also with the data that I received, um, which one is the most accurate and then used the accurate parts of the others. Um, so it's kind of like a work of three. Yeah, in this case, it was three blueprints. On the mm -hmm. um, Gazelle, it was uh, one blueprint that was actually pretty good, but I figured it was off at some point on the nose part. Um, so um, changed it there. And basically what you do is you have your blueprints that you set up in the 3D program uh, on a plane, make them transparent to a certain point, and then you start to model from there. Um, Going into how to do it, like the whole process, um, would take too long. Probably mm -hmm. we would sit mm -hmm. here tomorrow. And, and uh, <laughs> I can, if you want to know how it's done, 
um, just check out uh, um, a quick modeling tutorial um, mm -hmm. or like a quick, um, actually a time frame of a modeling a tutorial in 3ds max maya mm -hmm. or blender uh you can find videos like that and you will see like a 30 minute video mm -hmm. that actually then sp speed up and this video might have taken and recording four or five hours or longer okay. so um they can see actually how this uh, starts out and basic i think it's quite and, um, fascinating fascinating stuff i think would you say that this is um really a labor of love um, doing yes. this kind of thing because one thing I've one thing I've learned in in DCS and you get all the I have to be careful I don't want to upset anyone you get if the people out there you know there's a lot of kind of discontent in the in the forums in Hoggett and stuff like that and people are saying oh they just do this for money they everyone just does it for money the one thing I've learned in DCS from being in there in the middle is that no one makes any money out of DCS and um, you know barely enough to cover your costs I, I would you say out here. Being a developer and other developers, and just is it really is a labor of love, isn't it? You've, you're not getting uh, an hourly rate out of this. Well, the, the problem is when you develop um, and you don't have a module out yet, you don't have any income. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to cover your, your expenses some in, in a different way. So, for example, um, um, when we started um, Polish Up Simulation, I was still working by then for PlayStation for a while mm -hmm. um, and changed profession then um, back to the roots because um, uh, I was then working for an embassy um, as a bodyguard for a while. And um, so we had to generate our own funding, personal fundings, mm -hmm. because we, we didn't get any money out of it until the release. And um, then from the release, basically, you, yeah, just in business terms. You have to cut from ED tax and so on and so on. So there's a certain amount that is actually in the bank account of the company and where it stays. Um, and um, I think it's depending um, if you can make money out of a module and survive and live from that. It totally depends on what you do, what kind of aircraft you, you choose um, and um, how many people you have to feed with that money. That's okay. the, the biggest uh, have you never been? Have you never been tempted? I mean, I can. I know the answer is no, obviously. But um, have you never been tempted to do just like a really popular model that you know is going to sell? I can't think of any examples now, but you know, like I don't know, F fifteen or something that's, that's that you can model from blueprints Blue and, and you know is just going to sell like hotcakes. This is why. This is why I kind of I can I can see the planes that you've chosen. You've kind of do it for love rather than you know trying to get sales figures. It's just, I just thought you'd, your thoughts on that. We do have a list. Um, of aircraft and Kyle was also on there um, and um, how should I phrase this the best without uh, pissing anybody off <laughs> um, yeah. there, there are certain factors that you have to overcome um, till you can actually say this is going to be released um, and the Gazelle was more easy because it was our first uh, helicopter it was kind of like okay first entry and so on and so on um but now after the the kiowa uh, after the gazelle we actually plan to have the bow 105. roger this left with oliver we split up because the team wasn't functioning as a team anymore Pfft, i don't want to go into detail yeah, there because yeah. we actually made a cut there in 2017 and um no matter if we had a finished um code or not basically what happened was we had to make the split um so um then we had to come up with something new um and the kyle was already on my list there um for after the bow 105 um so um the list is a little bigger um the biggest problem is basically um to get access to information so if we talk about an apache for example um if you if you really think of something that is the super hot seller mm kind of like a 14 topic just mm -hmm. in helicopters um the biggest problem are basically governments if you can actually have access to certain information or not um and without getting into problems um i guess oleg the name is well known in the community now um so that's something uh, you always have to be careful about as a developer that you're not going into prison for anybody mm -hmm. so that's something that sometimes i feel personally when i read the forum uh, what people demand and request in the aircraft that they're not seeing the big picture mm -hmm. that a lot of the stuff that's actually done or has to be done might be in a term of restricted or classified mm -hmm. um 
so same for the F-16. I know there are some systems that will never be in this aircraft, mm. although some people know about it. So this is one part, like how complex is the aircraft? Then will you have issues with getting the information? Where do you get the information from? And whom are you talking to next? So for us as Polish Ship Simulation, we actually um, decided at the beginning of creating the company um, something very crucial for us. It might be a crutch, uh, for some people, or they might think that's a crutch, but I figured it's the exact opposite. We did, did decide to not do anything in particular without a permission from a um, manufacturer, which would um, inhibit or basically inherit a license agreement from that manufacturer, mm -hmm. which is, for example, took me 13 months to get the permission from uh, Airbus for the Gazelle mm -hmm. and the Bo 105. So that's a long process. And out of these first given factors, you have to choose the object that you want to do. Disregarding what kind of labor or what you want to have um, as personal favor, um, there are some objects or some, I would say, fighters or helicopters that are more hard to be done on the first part. So Apache, for example, I can tell you straight up, is such an aircraft that will be very hard to get permissions from mm. manufacturer, DOD, and so on and so on, US Army, whoever you want to talk to, because it's an active active um, aircraft, um, it's not retired. And um, so then the next part is Eagle Dynamics. Can Do they trust you that you can pull it off or not? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's the other part. <laughs> I don't know about that. So you have to talk to them as well. And uh, so there's a lot of negotiation that is happening before an aircraft. And as people might have seen it, we were very, very calm during 2018 and 17, what was going on on our site, because there was a lot going on in the background in terms of contracts, in terms of licenses, and so on and so on. So we could not just say, hey, we're actually talking to Bell because of that and that we couldn't and we didn't want to because we didn't want to risk any possible issues with the license signature uh, from bell or our side and then the same was with eagle dynamics and um i mean yeah we are in contact with eagle dynamics um and they actually know what we're doing um which is which should be um the mm -hmm. way um so um that we can actually kind of like say hey this is what we're doing this is what we're planning how can we go with that and this is like all the prayer talk before you actually do the first next step and um yeah so we have a list what kind of list it is i'm not going to talk about it because that would reveal yeah, probabilities yeah. or like people would go crazy like oh they want to do this helicopter mm -hmm. ah no and you know how the community is yeah. so then it's better to for i guess that's the rule for any developer out there that's why you hear not much about some stuff it's just like keep it more on the subtle side and you have less issues and you don't uh, make false promises or whatever mm -hmm. people would call it then yeah so right okay thank you that's been fascinating okay excellent um did you have any memorable problems in the modeling of the aircraft in whatever sound visuals whatever just any any it's just an interesting question i thought yeah, in terms of the gazelle, um, the biggest problem was actually um, getting information on the devices for the gun and the rocket and the Mistral, because there is none of that information available anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. Even the French army, we asked them, or a friend of mine, he asked uh, in a certain department, and they were like, hey, sorry, we, we actually destroyed all the information mm -hmm. in 2007 or so, when the sacrifice was actually retired out mm -hmm. of their stock they destroyed everything and all the information as well so um then finding the information on these devices the control units that was the biggest problem on the gazelle um i think other than that patrick is not here he could give answers in terms of coding or the sound stuff multi um, yeah, multi crew was actually an experiment and um and we were um the multi crew was already done before the actual release of the gazelle but we decided okay let's go further let's take our time to see how we can fix some issues that were um, rising up in the already in the time of the release um and um so we we got it fixed to a certain point um but 
the DCS network code, it's an old code. Mm -hmm. So there are some things that will be done different today compared to like yesterday, basically in a short term. So um, yeah, multi-crew is probably at the current stage, the most, um, maybe not the most complicated, but the most fragile part, because um, it's depending on a lot of factors that are coming from either network connection or like how is the game transferring certain code information from A to B, from B to A because it's always transferring back and forth. And how is it done inside of the game code, um, the network connection and the communication between two clients. And um, the best way the Gazelle works in multi-crew is actually in a LAN. If you have a have a side-by-side mm -hmm. um, computer without any um, huge interference of data transfer, um, the multi-crew is actually very solid. Um, so that's yeah, actually that's the good. best part of, of of using it um desync uh i think if people complain about desyncs and multi-crew um you have that in any of the multi-crew aircrafts or even not just in multi-crew but also multiplayer and since i fly online actively in a squadron as well in my free time um i see it every day when i fly uh, that there are desyncs mm. and missiles wings mm. of f14 mm. whatever yeah. I, I we could name the list yeah yeah, yeah. But to be fair it's in every module it's just like a helicopter has different visuals just as example n no fighter aircraft has a rotor on top mm. which is needs to be synced if it's not synced <laughs> yeah then it looks weird so mm. um there are a lot more moving parts on a helicopter um for the animations than on a fighter where you have more visuals um yeah, then again, yeah. we, we have good hopes, uh, you know, we know because it was announced by ED, they are working on the multi-crew for the, uh, for the UE. Mm. And, uh, well, it, it seems like they've put a lot of work into that because there was a feature promised back at the release of the UE. And, uh, yeah, we hope uh, when that is implemented uh, with an up updated code, we can port it over to... Uh, to the gazelle. I could tell so you. Not... Well, go ahead. I was going to say, so that's not even like a guaranteed thing that developers will get access to that kind of code. Like they, just um, gonna... I cannot You're really. Hope... You say you're it hoping. Because... Okay. No, I, I cannot really talk about it because uh, that's part of the NDA. What we uh, talk to ED. I can tell you one thing. Before Christmas, I was talking with the person in charge, or basically with one of the people in charge. And even now, after Christmas, but uh, they're on their Christmas holidays. So um, I guess next week I will have more answers on certain stuff. And we'll see how ED will do it, uh, how they decide to give access here or there. Uh, it's, it's up to them. But in the end, um, it will be, I think, I think, it will be available for uh, the developers that need it um, in the first place. So, um, and I think... Okay. There is currently no other developer besides ED and us who does helicopters and needs a side by side cockpit. So, oh. okay, guys. And they know that we need it. So I've talked to to the uh, to one of the producers and I said, "Hey, um, this is what we need um, for the Kiowa to work. Um, it's not possible for us to split the cockpit like we tried in the Gazelle." Um, and we even made the multi-crew before Heatler made it, just we used a different way. As I remember, we didn't use the API of uh, Eagle Dynamics. So we made our own thing. And um, as far as I understood it, um, Heatler used for the beginning um, the API of uh, the multiplayer there. So, and then made their own thing out of it. Um, yeah. Roger, um, what is your favorite feature of the Gazelle, either the real life or the DCS? Just your favorite bit of it. Everyone has a favorite bit of something. Uh, Dan, go ahead, because I have to really think about it. <laughs> well, you know, you know, I like I like the scout role, and you know, sneaking up on mm -hmm. uh, your targets, and uh, in multiplayer, uh, not even engaging, but you know, uh, relaying uh, positions and stuff. You know, it's 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 the role that really attracts me. Mm -hmm. We've just started doing that on our missions, haven't we? We guide, we we've finally got. So we've never used helicopters properly because none of us are helicopter 
helicopter pilots, even virtual helicopters. But we've finally got our proper helicopter pilots in, and we're talking proper, you know, real helicopter pilots flying now. And they're in there, and they can do proper scouting and, and uh, transmitting information and coordinates over and stuff like that. I find it fascinating. Uh, what about you, Sven? For me, actually, uh, the Gazelle, it was never my favorite helicopter ever. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. But since it was already there, we went with it. But in terms of what we have now in the Gazelle, um, my favorite part of the Gazelle is actually the view to the outside through mm. the front canopy. It's amazing. You can isn't it? see a lot. And um, that's probably the. My, in the beginning, it was I had to get used to it because uh, I was lacking some visual references when I started flying it. Um, but then you get used to it. I love it. I love the yeah. version. I forgot. I think it's the minigun version, but I can't remember. That takes half of the cockpit away, and you can just see the whole bubble in front of you. It's almost a bit too much vision. Like the doors off, isn't it? Mm. The doors are also off. Yeah. <laughs> um, but still, if you're on the pilot side on the other versions, you have the same visibility. What I don't like in the L is actually the the um, sighting system because it's kind of like blocking your view yeah, sometimes. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. So, uh, but I don't like that in the MI8 either. So that's why if I fly MI8, I fly on the right seat. Roger. Okay, guys. Right, let's push on. Uh, what do real pilots... We've kind of covered this, and what do real pilots think? I mean, you've had, like you said, which is kind of what we suspected, if you have 10 different pilots fly, you get 10 completely different answers because everyone's got an opinion and everyone's biased at the end of the day. Anything you want to add to that? I think... I don't have anything to add to that. Um, no, no, me neither. No, I've, I've been talking to, uh, you know, our, our pilot group. Um, yeah, like I said, there are some, some guys that say, hey, you shouldn't change too much because it, it feels right, except for uh, going outside the uh, regular envelope that, that can be changed. Um, and others are, uh, you know, not as satisfied with it, so we have to find a balance. But on yeah. the other hand, the, the way uh, the new flight model system works is that it, it's all based on real-time calculations. So it, it will feel more realistic. But in the end, it might end up feeling quite the same. Mm. If we don't, did a good job on uh, the flight model as it is right now, you shouldn't feel too much of a difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but on the other hand, you know, it, it's it's... You know, we'll have to see when it's implemented. To put it simple, if you have one car and put two different drivers into a car, they will both have a different opinion of this car. And since I ride motorcycles, fast motorcycles, um, fast cars, they they feel slow for me. And others, mm -hmm. they jump in there and they're like, oh, this car has 450 horsepower. This is really pushing. I'm like, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is like personal feeling is... Subject of change. Mm. Um, I just have something to add on that. Um, I'll have to speak for him because he's not here. It's 6 a.m. in Tennessee. But um, Stalker, one of our Grove members, um, he's a, a retired Army pilot. And um, he says it feels great. He's really happy with it. I, he, he, within minutes of, of downloading the module, was, you know, hovering around and, and all that sort of stuff. Yes. Like, it, I mean, I, I took three weeks to work out how to fly the damn thing, and in the end, I put curves in. But he doesn't use curves or anything. He just, you know, he barrel rolled it the second day he had it. You know, so um, his comments to me were that exactly what I said for the weight and size, and, and he's flown Apaches, Cobras, Kiowas. Um, mm. He said for the size of it, and and the rotor system and all that, it feels like it should. Mm. Well, there you go. So I'd take that as a positive comment. Mm. All right, guys, uh, let's push on. Um, to you polydrop guys, or I don't know if anyone who wants to chime in, any brief, um, particular, interesting Gazelle DCS moments, like, I don't know, blowing up a base or something that stood out? Um, anyone got any ideas? I think for me, the most memorable one is the last mission that Dan created for me and one of the test pilots, a friend of mine um, who's on the Alpha team of the Kiowas. Um, was the mission that he created where we were supposed to fly some profile like the Kiowa to check out the mission design itself. Um, that's probably the most memorable one because um, I haven't touched the Gazelle for a long time, mm. really, because I was doing all the flight testing on the Kiowa. So kind of, yeah, last time, how long is that ago, Dan, that you made the mission? 
last last year 2019 and, and yeah i guess so yeah somewhere so that's probably the, the biggest memory i have um other than that no there's no special memory where i would say hey this is oh yeah oh no there's one memory i have um in the beginning when um i started learning the gazelle um i put this tail stinger into the ground nearly on every takeoff mm -hmm. that's something i remember well that happened mm -hmm. for like a week or so and then i was like okay now take your time um to to actually understand how this aircraft takes off how you have to maneuver and uh then i just did my hover for like 10 15 hours dip my taxi for 10 hours and then just advance step for step by step into the actual aircraft and took my time i i have a comment i know this the questions are for these guys but i just uh, from our side of view, um, with the grav guys, one thing that sticks out for me is um, Soames in the Mistral, you know, oh, in God. the coffee campaign. Deadly. He was killing everyone, <laughs> including our own team, but he, <laughs> he, he certainly took out a lot of fast jets um, and, and ruined a lot of days for a lot of people. He was taking out flankers. He was doing more damage than us, taking out, you know, proper <laughs> PvP spec guys in flankers. It's uh, unbelievable, isn't it, what you could do? Um, for me, um, I'm a terrible helicopter pilot, and every time I have it, I just get shot down, I get my rotors shot off. But I remember Aunt, we did a mission, helicopter mission, and Auntie, um, who's here, um, she, we, we, were, we were scouting, like I, like I said to, stay four miles away from the target, use your mic missiles. We were all trying to do that, trying to be patient. Auntie put an IR uh, shielded thing, deflector on, and just charged straight into the enemy base. And I said, Auntie, what the hell are you doing? You're going to get shot. She was, no, 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 I'll be fine. I've got the IR deflector on. And suddenly all of the Strellas opened up at the base. I don't know if anyone else can remember this. It was quite a while ago. And you just got like had 20 missiles. Auntie somehow managed to turn around, dodge all of the missiles, and then fly back. I just found that, I found that quite funny. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. It makes, sense. Really it makes sense because uh, helicopters have a very, very low mm. um, IR signature. Um, I actually, in, in our own Discord, I posted a video of a 429 um, IR video mm -hmm. where they were recording it in IR and you can see how low the actual IR signature is compared mm -hmm. to a fighter. So um, it's expected. Plus the rotor disc washes away um, mm -hmm. the hot air into the cold air so it cools down quicker. Um, there are some factors in helicopters that make them less vulnerable to IR missiles than people think. Um, and um, I had to relearn some concepts there as well um, while we were working on the uh, Kiowa basically. Because uh, these guys gave us a lot of input there. Roger, guys. Okay, very good. Um, can you auto... So I'm assuming this is in DCS world. Can you... Is auto-rotation modeled in the Gazelle? Yes. Okay, that's fine. And I can back this up because I did an auto-rotation video and I could do all... Uh, it was a lot harder for me in the Gazelle. I think it's because the rotors didn't have much momentum in them. So they, they tended to slow down quicker than the others. But we mm -hmm. could do it. Anyone else? Any comments on that? Yeah, Stalker does it all day. Oh, he right. does it for. There you go. I'm st I'm still laughing from you from that story. <laughs> no, it was good. It made a good video at the end of the day. Okay, guys, very good. Let's push on. Are there any plans for the minigun gunners? So that's the guy on the side to have AI like on the Huey, or will there always be only playable slots? Yeah, I that's... can answer that if you yeah. if you want. Then um, yeah, go ahead, Mister. I can't give any promises because. Uh, yeah, we just don't do that, but uh, we have a new coder. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a dedicated uh, Gazelle team at the moment, and uh, the AI gunners are one of the things on the list we're checking out. So we hope to implement it, but uh, no promises. Roger, no, that'd be cool. Yeah, I'd, uh, yeah that's fine. Okay. Um, are there any plans to allow the co-pilot and pilot to switch controls, i.e. each have the ability to fly the aircraft? I'm assuming like on the um, uh, MI-8 you can do that, can't you? So the pilot may adjust radios, Nadir, etc. Comments on that, please, guys. Um, in terms of multiplayer or single player? I don't know. That's a question. I don't know. Uh, if in, so in the MI-8. Multiplayer, multi-crew. Okay, so I can say in, in single player, if you're flying the aircraft alone, um, in multiplayer, you can um, 
fly the aircraft from both seats. We had the option for multi-crew um, when it was released, the multi-crew function that both pilots could operate and fly the aircraft. But at some point, because of some issues inside of the network code, we actually scratched that we, because it was causing too many issues in, in the remaining functioning code. So we made the call, I think a year or like roughly a year after the multi-crew was released, um, we made the call, okay, we changed it here. So maybe some people will remember that we're flying multi-crew in the beginning um, with people that you could operate the system as a pilot from both seats. Um, that was possible. Um, so I'm not sure if it will come back. Um, it's depending on what happens there on the multi-crew side for helicopters on the ET side. Well, jump. Okay. Well, I think that answers the next one too. Um, well, this yeah, this this one was just actually mine. What's the score on the Gazelle Mark could no longer working now? I may be out of date here. I haven't tested it in a while. The last time I tested it, I was doing some tutorial videos, and every time I jumped in the um, the you know the, the 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 second player slot or the minigun, then all of the dials on the, the the aircraft shut. It was still flying around, but for me, the aircraft shut down. The rotor stopped spinning. And we're yep. still flying around, so is that right? Yeah. That's well, the the, the thing is, <clears throat> yeah, it's part of the desync, and uh, we noticed uh, at the release of the Gazelle, it was kind of functioning, Agreed. and uh, with with all the updates on ED side, you know, improving the engine, we we saw a de degradation of uh, of the multi crew functionality, and uh, yeah, a common problem is uh, the engine sync. Uh, so one player sees uh, the, the rotor spinning and the other sees like, you know, it's mm. it's standing still and uh, is, yeah, it, it deteriorated over time. There is a guide, isn't there, on getting the closest possible sync for if you've got two players, you know, you both start at this, uh, you let the pilot start, but they don't start up the helicopter, the, the other guy gets in and then it keeps the sync going as long a lot better than mm. I was reading in right. the manual in the documents section of the Gazelle. There's a manual there on how to get multi crew working as best as possible, in, as in sync as possible, perhaps is the best way to put it. Mm. Yeah, it, 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 but it's not solid because sometimes I had um, moments where um, I was flying with another guy in multi crew. I remember that like two years ago. Um, we did the start up and the sync didn't happen, so then I jumped out restarted DCS basically to actually have a fresh working mm. DCS and jumped into the helicopter when it was fully operational. And then I had a proper sync. So it's it's kind of like there's not really a rule of thumb. It's either yeah, one it's or the other. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, in the, in the end, all the multi-crew questions can be answered with, you know, we hope the implementation of, uh, you know, the, uh, the multi-crew for, for the UE is going to help us uh, create a better uh, both crew uh, function for us. This is um, this is just an unfortunate way that the system is set up. That we've got ED who keep changing things. I guess as they should do, and then a bunch of third party modules bolted on the side. And every time they seem to change something, it breaks the third party modules. Uh, and then the the you guys are always chasing your tail to try and catch up. But that that's how it is for everyone. Um, so mm. nothing we can do about that. Okay, guys, very good. Um, can the real life Gazelle laser. This is something we've always missed. We really wanted with this plane. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we can't, we you know don't have it. Uh, okay, in, obviously you can't in DTS. Could the real one ever laser designate? Does anyone know? No, it, no, it cannot. It, it only has a laser to range. Mm. That's a shame. But you know that, that's where the uh, Kiowa comes in. You Roger. can do that. The first French helicopter that was able to range and laser at the same time was the Tiger. Right okay. on the French side. Roger. Okay, very good, guys. Uh, how much involvement did French or other armed services have in the design and feedback? We've sort of covered that, but anything you want to add to that? Uh, well, I, I hope that uh, in the future, the guys that were actually contacting us, uh, other people, and uh, the way that we're approaching this will hopefully um, make it a little bit closer tie to the people that are actually flying the aircraft and maybe even the French army. We, we will see um, how this will go. And um, yeah, that's yeah. Just just to clarify that, you know, um, I was not involved with the original release of, uh, of the Gazelle. So I don't know how uh, much pilot input there was uh, in the beginning. But uh, since we picked up the project again, uh, you know, and try uh, trying to speed up development uh, in parallel with the Kaiwa, 
uh, we have a number of pilots who contacted us. They are all in the, in the, in the feedback group, and uh, well, you know, they are all uh, they, yeah, you know, they are all from the uh, the French Armed Services, and yep. uh, plus Patrick yeah. has another set of pilots as well from the French Armed Forces. Right. Right. them directly. Problem for me is I I cannot stay too close to the guys there because I don't speak French, and unfortunately, many French pilots don't speak uh, good English. I figured it's like, yeah, hit or miss there as well, as Dan said on the multi crew, um, with the language. So, um, it's sometimes hard to find the people mm -hmm. that can communicate with you and uh, actually not just communicate, but also transfer the information in the proper uh, tongue, mm -hmm. I would say. Okay, guys, a um, couple of silly ones. Um, are you planning to make a tornado that would, my dreams <laughs> will come true? I'm guessing we're getting a no comment on that. Uh, I don't. I didn't even know there was rumors of that. But don't guess if you <laughs> if you don't have an answer yet. <laughs> um, let's put it that way. Um, that's something I can say. Um, there was a plan to do so, um, and it's still somewhere up. But I'm waiting for certain information um, on a tornado that are crucial for this um, module to even be considered um, being done by us into the final version. Cap knows the guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good, guys. Um, this is one's just appeared. Can you do a Blue Thunder one? Now, remind me, guys, uh, my 80s movies are a bit sketchy. So, is this the guy? Is this Roy Schneider? It was Blue Thunder. Uh, I'm bad in names. Is that, is um, that the, the guy from the, Jaws? The, the, so the guy from Jaws. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Roy Schneider. And was was that. I remember it's a blue helicopter. I can't remember what helicopter it was. Is that a gazelle? Yeah, that's a gazelle. It's a gazelle with a different front end. Picture, on it. please. Picture, please. Let me go. <laughs> We, this is very important. We can interrupt this. Blue Thunder images. Basically, the Blue Thunder, oh. as far as I remember from the time when I was a kid and remember the functions that it had, um, <laughs> it had all the, the superficial, back then superficial functions that are nowadays normal on um, surveillance helicopters or right. even Apache or stuff like that. So basically, it's made, it's, you've made a really beautiful gazelle really ugly. It's like a lovely, beautiful <laughs> curved gazelle. And yeah, made but if it you're from 80s, the 80s. 80s shoulder pad <laughs> version. God. But I heard that this uh, helicopter is still somewhere standing in a, wow. a barn in Hollywood. Though. It's a back it's, lot. Yeah, it's in a back lot. Okay. It's supposed to be still there somewhere. That's probably worth some money now, guys. Jesus, look at that. All right. I wouldn't pay a dime for it. <laughs> I, I would like to say I'm going to go. I'd like to say... No, okay. Anyway, that's what it really is. Okay, Blue Thunder. Uh, will you be doing anything to link in with the forthcoming Falklands map? Why? Who would put that? Why would they have a link to the Falklands? Were the gazelles in the Falklands? Yes. Um, oh, they were, really? but they were the, fruit, the British gazelles. That's fine. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know. Jesus. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, that will just be up to the user to, to create scenarios and stuff. Uh, that's yeah. something we, we will be doing. We will, guys. We will, I can assure you. Right. That's the gazelle and the miscellaneous featured. Any final thoughts on the gazelle before we go to the Kiowa? And we will be brief as we can on the Kiowa. Beautiful. Right, Kiowa. So first of all, my apologies in that... Um, I'm aware it's here. I know Shifty's been flying it around and whatnot, but we've been so busy on other things at the moment, like legit. I just haven't had time to look into it. So I am going to be a complete noob on this, but we're going to just blast through. Uh, questions on the Polychop or on the Kiwa. Will your module be the Fox version and incorporate the Sperry system as well as Anvis? Okay, that means nothing to me, but you guys send. Okay, you... so basically what I understand by this question is if it's the OH58 Foxtrot, which was a proposal from Bell um, Textron to the United States Army as a follow-up of the OH58D, which had the camera moved to the front and had different um, avionics and different systems. And I think even a different engine, but I would have to check this out. Um, no, we're not doing the Foxtrot version um, because... Um, it was not deployed into the troops and uh, there were just i think a few handful of versions that were built for test flights and showing this off to the army so what we are building is the oh58d kiowa warrior r which is the latest version um that was uh, put into service so um the r stands actually for the upgraded version with all the um, missile or actually weapon equipment um because the Kiowa War, actually the OH-58D has um, two different designations. It's One is the OH-58D Kiowa, which didn't have any weapons. 
um, and the weapons were integrated fully into the operational systems in the United States Army um, in 1992. And then this, this whole OH-58D program, it's not a, it's, it's just a program. It's, it's um, not like a, wait, was it a program? Something, there was a terminology that the pilots explained to me. It was never kind of like a full system like the Apache or the UH-60. Um, so it was always outside of the Army um, um, funding. Um, so in 1992, the Congress made the decision, okay, we will upgrade all the Kiowa Ds to a fully Kiowa Warrior. And Kiowa Warrior stands for the actual um, armed reconnaissance aircraft. And the R is the latest update um, that they had there. So this is what we're going to build and what we're working on, um, as people could see in the streams. And um, in terms of Envis, Envis is actually the so-called night vision HUD system. Um, I guess that's what this part, this person wants to refer to. Um, I don't want to say much about the night vision, how far we will go. Um, but I would say in this term, so not making any promises, but we have talked about certain things, Patrick and I. Um, just be surprised if something happens or not in that term. Um, I can tell you, though, night vision is already functioning in the Kiowa War. And it's a pain in the ass to fly this helicopter at night, even mm -hmm. with night vision. Roger. Okay. Very briefly, is that the the big knob on top of the rotor? Is that the kind of camera and sensor pack or, or whatever up there, I'm guessing? I don't see what else. Yes. That's the mass mounted sight. Yeah. Um or short MMS, um, which has the flare camera, um, and the normal TV, and the laser rangefinder and the laser range designator. Ooh, cool. We can use um, this for lasing guys. How about that? So but um in terms of a misconception of people, which I had myself, um, the laser of the MMS is not in the visual arena. So you will not see, like in DCS, when yeah. you see the drones lace something, you see this laser spot. Mm -hmm. This is not going to happen on the um, OH-58D. They have a different laser for that. Roger. So. Okay, presumably you can change the PRF of the laser because we have all problems. Yes. With comp we have, you know, 30 of us lasing. Right, good. Okay, so what we'll have to do, guys, we'll have to attach a Kiowa to each um, each flight with uh, the laser codes and, and send them out ahead. I uh, can tell you that the laser of the MMS can actually go from 1,111, which is the, 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 the yeah. shortest poles, all the way to 9,999. That's actually the information that, or not, kind of like 9999 which is the longest version it has a longer range that's the information that the pilots gave us um than the actual weapon systems can read so okay. cool look forward to it okay um is there a system for loading nav data from a file like the vegan yes it's already functioning and working um you cannot only learn load nav data you can also load um Laser codes, you can load NAV data, you can lo load target uh, locations that are given and uh, computed by somebody else inside of the system. Um, let me think. Um, laser code, you can load the weapon data of the Hellfire. Um, pop, 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 can you repeatedly reload it? So, you know, can you repeatedly reload it? So some of the... Some of the camp, uh, servers we have run for you know six hours. So if you like, can you load it? Load it's a client file sided. Each it's time client you... sided. So basically, how this works on our side is you have the mission cartridge, and um, it's not um, server sided. It's client sided. So you can actually prepare this inside of the server or at any time in a mission, and even on the fly in a mission. Um, for example, a guy of your group comes back to the farm, he lands there, you can actually wait already on your desk and tell him, hey, dude, I'm sending you this mission file um, through Discord, just put it into the folder, load it up in your aircraft as if you would be a maintenance crew chief, walk up to the aircraft, have new mission updates from mission command, give the latter cartridge to the pilot, they put it in, get the new missions, and off they go without restarting the system. And mm -hmm. this is client-sided, not server-sided. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys. So in theory, Sorry, you ahead. can actually plan. You can you can have a battlefield, and you can not, or you you can have just a battlefield with groups, regiments, or whatever. Nobody has an actual flight plan. Somebody is making the flight plan ready, and while they're flying the mission, he could make a new flight plan for a different group, um, for a different target, whatever the scenario is, and set give it to that pilot. Even in flight, he could put it in there, um, and load it up. So. 
Is the, That's how it br- works. Br- briefly, is the uh, nav system, is it INS or GPS or Doppler or...? Um, only GPS. Wow, so that's nice and modern, good. Okay, that's very good. Okay, guys, let's push, push on, guys. Uh, will both pilot stations... Well, wait, Sorry. it's not true. There is an INS system, but that was degraded and taken out at some point of the time because they're working just through satellites nowadays. So um, they had, in the older versions, in the 90s, they also had an INS system in there. Modular. But it was not reliable enough because uh, you had to update after a certain mileage, like 20, 30 miles of flight. Oh God. You had to update the INS each time and recalibrate it. So <clears throat> that was a pain in the ass. We won't be able to navigate when we do our tunnel flights. <laughs> okay, guys, very good. Um, we'll both, uh, very quickly, yes or no, is this, is this a multi-crew? Helicopter. Uh, will both pilot stations be able to change controls? Um, the question is like how 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 is this question stated? Is that about flying the aircraft, or is that about the controls on 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 the MFD? Um, that's the big question I have here in terms of details of this question. Um, at the moment, since there is no update yet on the multi crew, um, we cannot say much about how much of the possibilities we will do uh, in terms of flying. In general, the way how it is um, in real. Um, the pilot and the co-pilot, they both have a control stick, uh, a cyclic. But the co-pilot can actually dislink the cyclic from the actual control linkage and fix it in front of himself, um, which they do, or which they were doing. I'm not sure if they were always doing it, but uh, as far as I know, um, there were accidents happening. Um, then there were some procedures changed um, for this combination of both control sides. And um, so in general, you can have the left side unlinked. Um, so at the moment, you can fly it in a single player or multiplayer environment where you only have one pilot. You can fly it on both sides. My job. Um, yeah, yeah how far this will go into the multi-crew? We don't know yet. Maybe in multi crew we will um, disable that function of flying it from the left seat. We'll see. Um, depends on how good the multi crew itself is and how it handles that feature in the QE. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what will? What is the release date? And this guy's put three question marks, so he really wants to know the release date. Apparently, <laughs> uh, unanswerable question, I suppose, as ever. Uh, I give it the question back with three. Um, <laughs> explanation marks. Explanation marks. Twenty twenty. <laughs> there you go. That's that's what you get. Okay, very good. Um, will the Kiel I have Hellfires? Now we don't have Hellfires missiles in DCS yet, so this if it would be the first one. And laser yes. guided rockets. Uh, could someone describe to me very briefly? I'm aware of a Hellfire, but what it is? Is it wire guided? Is it what 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 type of missile is it? Um, the Kaiba will have the one f- 114 health, uh, kilo Hellfire, so uh, it's a laser-guided, uh, semi-guided, laser-guided um, uh, Hellfire. Um, so you have to actually have a laser spot for mm-hmm. the Hellfire to home itself in. Um, the kilo has a nice function uh, after some updates um, that it can re-home on a laser loss. So that means like, for example, a tree or whatever breaks your laser, Mm -hmm. um, which it does in DCS as well on our side, um, that a laser or whatever, an obstacle will break the laser lock um, or the guidance of the system um, that when you reacquire it, that the missile can actually reacquire that target spot as well, Mm -hmm. as long as it's in the seeker limits. Um, Yeah, so laser, Laser guided Hellfire is there. Um, to the Will question it be that you had, after launch? both lock on after launch and uh, lock on before launch. Uh, so we have five modes right now. It's low, low, high, low, and dear. So these are the five modes that the acro- that the actual missile has. Mm-hmm. Will it track a? It'll track a moving target. It'll track wherever the the laser spot is, presumably. Yes. There are radar guided versions too, but that's Roger. That's what, what kind of range have we got on this in good in a good scenario? Mm. You want to know the, the, the official real data? Uh, just, uh, or just the rough, non-official just... real data? Or that what you can do in DCS in, r- at roughly, the moment? Roughly in DCS, just so I can plan ahead. Halfway across an Iraqi airport. 
even further. <laughs> no, um, so Wikipedia says eight kilometers. Um, the missile is only depending on kinetics. So um, it will not have a missile timer, um, like a s missile safety. Mm -hmm. um, like, for example, in real, the AIM-120C has when it loses lock, mm -hmm. um, which has a missile timer of five seconds. Um, then it detonates. Um, so basically, um, this missile will just fly as long as it has enough kinetic energy to fly or hit the ground. Um, so in theory, eight kilometers is, is, is a good range. You mm. can extend to a certain point. And I was discussing this uh, actually tonight with the pilots because um, I was testing the Hellfire on our side mm -hmm. on some parts. And um, we were discussing certain features of what can the modern ones do, what were the old ones do, um, how is the system working in terms of how far did the laser work properly and so on so there in real there are a lot of more factors than in dcs mm -hmm. um, and in reality it's way more complicated to mm -hmm. be in parameters for a hellfire than in dcs so okay um but in general eight kilometers and a little bit on top more jump so that's five miles for us english folk right very good um and it says and lady guided rocket so i guess it means like the jf-17 those new brms is that a thing mm -hmm. oh they're called uh ANPKWS, which is called Advanced Position Kill Weapon System. Um, we did integrate them because we know that, or we, we got the information that one of the current operators of the Kiowa uh, has purchased that system from the United States Army, or basically from the, um, uh, what's it called, not DOD. Um, it's a different name of the department um, that actually is there for the purchases. Well, anyways, but they purchased that from the United States as well. So we were thinking about, okay, what can we integrate into the Kiowa? Um, how far was the integration done? Um, one of our test pilots actually who was on the stream as well, um, just wasn't there through direct voice, uh, through discord. So it's hard sometimes to hear him on the stream. Um, his uh, call sign is Saber. Um, he was actually um, also testing the, these systems, um, including the uh, GAU-19, um, which is a Gatling gun um, mm -hmm. like you find it on the... I'm not sure if the the, the Super Cobra or, or the Viper has the GAU-19, um, but basically the GAU-19 was tested as well, but that was never integrated because it was causing fractures. So we were also making the call, do we make a GAU-19 available or only the M3P? We decided, okay, since it was not integrated into our army and caused fractures and um, was a nice feature, um, we decided, okay, let's skip it. We stay and stick with the M3P machine gun, which is uh, also 50 caliber like the GAU-19 and good enough for whatever you wanted to use it for in terms of soft target and medium, mm -hmm. medium soft targets. Okay, very good, guys. Um, I noticed in the TZ videos, different FARP objects being used. Are these third-party mods, or will additional objects be coming with the Kiowa? Dan, that's your question. Yeah, um, <clears throat> they are uh, models made by us, and they will be included with the Kiowa. Roger, can you give me uh, some examples? Unfortunately, I've, I've not really up to speed. Yeah, uh, you know, there's the uh, the, the the usual Hescos, a lot of uh, walls, uh, uh, small details like fire extinguishers, uh, basically anything to make your own farp, and mm -hmm. uh, also included are some uh, some uh, detailed range objects. Uh, we will be using that in the training campaign. Yeah. You know, from what I saw on the video, it looked like you know more temporary style files rather than this giant helipad that looks like it's made by an engine. Right. Uh, right. That's yeah. good. That's yeah. good. It's, yeah. it's all, all everything we made is based on pictures we uh, received from the uh, Kiowa pilots. So uh, yeah, well, basically yeah. we can recreate the stuff they they used in real life. That's Actually, cool. we made this on request by them as well. Because yep. they were kind of like, some of them fly DCS as well, and they were kind of like bored and fed up of this FARP. And they always were bitching, but this is not realistic. This is mm -hmm. not realistic. It's like, no, this is not what it would look like. And um, and a FARP actually is a moving thing. Mm -hmm. So it moves with the front line, and they have a certain distance um, to the front line. Um, I received from one of the pilots roughly the range, how far behind the actual enemy lines they, or like in front of them, they operate. Um, but this is like a detail um, I cannot share, sorry. 
on our, because that's, I mean, that's, that's really cool because on our big campaigns at the moment, what we do, Iron Wolf programs them and the helicopter, I don't know how all this works, I haven't got the foggiest, but the helicopters in our big dynamic campaigns now, they literally pick up boxes from somewhere, from a base, they sling load them or carry them somehow magically within the helicopter and then they go and move them 20 miles ahead under enemy fire, drop these boxes down and after a certain amount of drops, boxes have been dropped in a certain place, um, they physically, dynamically make a, a farp, don't they, Iron Wolf? Um, and I think it'd be great to have, and I must admit, those farps do look shy. So, uh, well, it is what you do. It, it's it's a fob to be oh, uh, forward oh, operating base. Hairs, <laughs> but, but, that's a that's a. But uh, I want to say this though: that it, it's only because DCS doesn't let you dynamically create farps. So, right. I guess the follow up to that is: will there be anything to dynamically create farps? Mm, we'll see how far we we can do stuff there. Dan and I we talked about some options that we would like to do and see as well. Um, so we'll see if we can um, manage to do that or not. Um, so that's yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to talk about it because we don't want to you know set expectations. Mm. We still have to experiment with it. But just know the the, the Kaiwa will come with its own ecosystem, as we call it, uh, with its own objects and stuff to to make it you know. Just, realistic right we'll probably end up trying to park every kind of aircraft that exists in there to see what happens <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right boys well done um do you have or intend to try and get ed's code for single cockpit body crew they are developing oh, we've covered this haven't we for the huey any yeah it's been mentioned a lot of times yeah we'll, we will try that for sure okay uh will the co-pilot be able to use what the rifle on the dash Okay. No, <laughs> that's quite cool. This is not armor. Um, this is not armor is why? Um, because um, first of all, um, there's a misconception in the community. Yes, the pilots used the rifle in combat, but um, to make a long story short, um, this these rifles that you see there um, were actually used for personal protection. If the helicopter goes down, that was the initial intention of it. Why they started to use it in combat for different sorties or why they practice shooting from the cockpit on the left seat um, was given by the ROEs in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, they were asked to do um, their missions sometimes or most of the times to have as less um, violent input into the target or any surroundings so it was the least measurement mm -hmm. um, or actual tool of of uh, aggression that they could use um, in terms of ranging out of the helicopter um, so there's a very um, yeah I guess probably the community knows the video as well where a Kiowa pilot or a Kiowa actually chases a, a motorcycle in Afghanistan um, and I've talked to the guys about it and I'm like, hey, why didn't they use the 50 cal or the rockets right up at the start? And they were telling me that the rules of engagement were the actual problem. So these guys were doing some bad stuff. They were around, they were tasked for the mission. So basically they tried to have these guys stop. So as you can see, they fire in front of the, or to the side of the, the motorcycle. And that were not guided shots. In the end, um, this escalated, as you can see in the video, and yeah, they had to do their stuff they had to do. And so this is not meant to be an actual combat tool for the Kiowa in the first place. And uh, on top of that, if we would do that, um, we would have to use resources that we want to spend on a different part of the helicopter. Because um, you only have a certain limited resources for multiplayer available and for single player. So um, for me, and even for Patrick, it made little sense in the ecosystem of GCS to use the M4 out of the uh, side. Not sure, guys. Very good. On the OH-58, which variant will you be releasing? And depending on flight model question mark, what type of armament will it have? We've kind of covered this, but anything you want to add to this? Mm, okay, so I can go into the full range of armament it will have. Um, it will have the Hellfire that we mentioned already. It will have the APKWS, which is the laser guided um, hydro rocket, um, which has a rough range of eight kilometers, um, but it has less punch, so it only has a 10 pound warhead, because um, it would then um, actually cross certain rocket limits in terms mm -hmm. of weight. Um, then it will have at the moment four different rocket head types for the normal rockets, uh, unguided rockets. It will have a smoke um, rocket, 
so that you can actually fire a smoke rocket and um, mark a target that way um, for whatever is out there. Um, it will have a 10 pound warhead, 17 pound warhead, and it will have a flare warhead. So like night f illumination for mm -hmm. battlefield illumination. Um, we are not sure yet if we will add flechette. Um, we were asked by our pilots and even by of pilots out of the community because maybe uh, it's known or not, but we were actually welcomed by the um, community there uh, of the Kiowa group, which is actually actively roughly 3,000 pilots and maintenance crew chiefs that are active in a crew uh, in a group. Um, we were asked by them if we will add um, flechette anti-personal uh, as well, but uh, this is a big question mark there. So that are the rockets. Then it will have the M3P, um, 50 caliber, uh, 50 caliber um, machine gun on the left side um, with 300 or 500 rounds because that were the setups as they flew it. Um, depending on weight and mission, they were using 300 or um, like if they were having uh, lower altitudes uh, environments, they were using 500 rounds. And uh, that will, as far planned, have different... Um, um, ammunition types as well. Yeah, mixes, um, combat mixes. mixes yeah, because um, uh, we, we talked to the pilots and I was like, hey guys, um, what kind of ammunition did you use? Did you only take a ball um, ammo, so which is like just a full metal jacket, 50 cal, or were there other ammunitions that you used in combat? And they were like going through the whole list and I was mm -hmm. like, holy shit, this, mm -hmm. is, this is every ammunition that is out there, mm -hmm. basically, from armor piercing, engineering rounds, blah, 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 you, you name it. Um, the problem for them was in combat that they didn't have that many of them, so they saved it for special missions mm -hmm. and most likely went out with normal um, format jackets. Um, but yeah, they were actually happy when they heard that we want to do different ammunition types for the M3P as mm -hmm. well, because uh, they were crying out like, hey, finally we don't have to um, wait for our supply. Um, we can actually go out there and do our shit we have mm -hmm. to do in the sim. Mm -hmm. um, and last but not least, um, the Stinger Block 1 will be in. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the point is, like, people um, see helicopters, which is kind of unfair, as being this this little sitting duck there, mm -hmm. um, which is not true. Um, I had the same concept, misconception, and um, the pilots actually told me that the United States Air Force and the Army, that some generals and Pentagon had a, had a verbal fight about who has the better troops and what they need. And the Army general actually told the Air Force general, dude, I don't need your Air Force. I can have my guys do all the shit that you guys do as well, mm -hmm. have air superm supremacy um, established with SAMS and now my helicopter is being cooked with stingers, what do you want? So they actually then fought kind of like personal fight and they set up a, um, a training, Air Force versus Army and basically the Army gave the United States Air Force a bloody nose mm -hmm. and verified, hey, we don't need you if we don't, if, if you're not available, we can stand our ground, even against mm -hmm. fighters without any issues, so. Okay, very good. Um, right, let's punch on, guys. Uh, how would you describe the flight model? This is an important one for me, obviously. How would you describe the flight model of the Kiowa in comparison to the Gazelle in DCS? Okay, this is this is now a question. Um, then I go ahead with answering that question. Um, what I want to say is, first of all, I don't want to sound biased. Um, that's the first part, um, which is, kind of like which could be the case if we're talking about the flight model that people think like ah they're biased look now they're selling mm -hmm. in an interview or whatever the flight model of the uh, Kiowa being that super duper uh, flight model and so on and so on so um, what I can say though is it feels and flies completely different in terms of feel than the gazelle the Huey MI8 or the K50. Mm -hmm. um, why is that? Um, we made our research um, while we were building the new flight model technology, um, which enables us to actually simulate any helicopter out there with our new technology um, in that way that it will have the proper flight model in terms of physics and the proper feel for that helicopter. Um, so basically, all the physics that you have in a helicopter, in a real helicopter, will be felt and available in that flight model, which is, um, I don't want to sound biased, as I said before, but as the streamer said, um, it will be the next generation of flight uh, helicopter, especially in DCS. Mm -hmm. And um, I even compared it to X-Plan helicopters and um, 
the pilots, at least two of them fly X-Plane as well on their free time. And um, we compared it to one of the available um, helicopters there that is close to the Kiowa. And um, they both stated, um, guys, you actually managed to even be closer to the rear aircraft than this particular aircraft that is an X-Plane. So, but that's their opinion. Um, my opinion generally is um, it's a new technology. It does feel different. Um, we had the available information um, on cyclic position, rudder position, um, pitch all the information on any state of flight um, of the rear aircraft. Uh, it's already in there. We will revisit some of the flight model one more time before release so that we can say, OK, this is nailed um, and with the pilots, basically, um, that they will have hands on again. And they are very nip picking, which is good because um, they feel and see stuff in the flight model on compared to the rear aircraft that the average user will not feel. So basically, um, if we would release it today, um, only the real pilots would be able to tell you already now if this is really 100% on, or let's say 98% on par with the rear aircraft. Because also in DCS, there are certain limits in terms of um, mm, yeah, aerodynamics. So, Okay, anything from Dan before we move on? Uh, well, you know, it, it, just keep in mind, uh, it, it's also a light helicopter and people will find it twitchy. And to be honest, I, I was used to... Uh, to did Gazelle, and for me, it was quite a shock uh, flying the uh, Kiowa for the first time. Uh, it can be quite a a chore. Um, it reacts to everything. You you increase uh, uh, torque, and something will happen. You have to, you know, constant constantly adjust to everything. And I think that's the the essence of uh, flying a helicopter. So, yeah, it feels right to me, but I'm not a, a real pilot uh, either. So yeah, it's up to the to the real pilots to decide whether it's uh, it's accurate or not. And so far, they are very happy with it. Um, as Alex said, it, um, the Kawa feels as if you jump on the back of a dragon and want to tame the dragon. Mm -hmm. That's actually something I think one of our test pilots said it the first time. That's also what the rear aircraft feels like. And a uh, huge difference is though um, what people um, should not um misunderstand it's a fully articulated rotor blade so um it's not an underslung system like in the huey so it doesn't it has a certain stability in hover but um it needs a lot smoother inputs so if you're used to fly a huey where where you throw around the stick mm -hmm. uh, to make it move if you do the same in the kiowa um, you will actually be all over the place, which mm. also happened to one of the pilots. He told me when he came from flight school, um, he was flying the 206, um, um, or basically the military version of the 206 um, in flight school, uh, which is an underslung system. So flies closer to the Huey um, and jumped into the Kiowa then in flight school. And he was all over the place in the first few hours until one of the instructors told him, just drive the, the cyclic as if you drive a pencil on a paper. Smooth hand, very soft, gentle. Be gentle to her, and she will be just fine. And this is what happened. And from there on, he was actually, um, yeah, Roger. with the aircraft. Okay, very good, guys. We'll see how that works out. Fingers crossed it's all. Um, okay, what are the best engagement ranges for different weapon systems on the Kiwa? I don't know what best means. Longest, optimum, um, I guess longest is what he means. Um, so we've had five miles from the Hellfire. Rockets at five miles as well for the laser guided rockets. Um, regards unguided rockets, I mean, they don't really have a maximum range, do they? Because they don't really have a, a proper way of aiming them, per se. Um, they have a max range, a theoretical max range of eight kilometers as well. Mm. Roger. It's just your aiming that's that's going to be a problem at some point. So, um, yeah. Um, pff, uh, who wants to aim at eight kilometers with a mm. rocket pinpoint yeah, strike right. something? <laughs> Good luck. Um, so you will very likely not use them at eight kilometers um, in general. Um, the Stinger itself has uh, roughly ra around eight kilometers uh, head-on range as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but it has a uh, missile timer of 19 seconds. So if it's uh, crossing that 19 seconds threshold, it will just detonate as a safety. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So we have that as well. Um, the gun. An average, the gun, yeah, I mean, it's a 50 caliber. It can fly a long distance. 
but um, finding the, the, the target, a mm. human, at greater than one and a half to two kilometers is, um, I would say, ballsy mm -hmm. and uh, very optimistic. So um, that's more for short range. Roger, very good. Um, is there a max range on the laser, did you say? There is a max range uh, in real, um, but I cannot say how much. Roger. On DCS, it's outranging. Uh, yeah, in DCS, it's actually hard coded. So, and I'm not sure uh, um, to what point. I think it was in DCS 15 kilometers or 20 oh, kilometers, well, but it's something that we yeah. can actually. That's actually what we we should be able to define on our site. So, um, yep. we'll see how far we go with that. Um, in terms of being not too close or maybe close enough in feel to the real deal, because um, that's actually classified part of the laser. Well done. How are you guys? What have you found to be the most fun using the Kiowa so far? So this is using it, not developing it. Then go ahead, because um, yeah. yeah, for me, for me, you know, uh, it's the uh, uh, the scout role and uh, lasing targets for other pl platforms, and that 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 does include uh, you know fighters. Uh, you know, you can lace for the F sixteen, F eighteen, you name it. And uh, you know, getting getting in, in close, hide behind some trees, start lazing, communicate with other parties, and uh, see stuff blow up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's cool. For me, um, the most fun is actually the flight model, um, throwing the helicopter around and the low level regime. We're talking a ten to five feet. That's where I like to fly helicopters in general. Um, that's the most fun for me at the moment. And um, yeah, then lasing the targets is also cool. Um, it depends on the mission. Um, yeah. So yeah, but basically the flight model is the most fun because it's different than the others. Um, it's challenging you um, from the hover all the way to the normal flight. And if you don't pay attention, um, you are actually um, either also in a turn or whatever. Um, yeah, in danger to crash the helicopter. So you have to be on the flight model and on the aircraft the whole time you fly it. So that's for me the biggest fun actually. Roger. Very good guys. Um, question: Will uh, sorry, does your aircraft FCS into oh god, does your aircraft flight uh, <laughs> the fire control system integrate digitally with the C two elements directly for target acquisition and fire? Right, someone's gonna have to explain that because obviously I don't understand it. Mm, I guess w when we talked earlier about this question, I I, I think the person who asked the question um, was basically asking if we can. Um, send targets from aircraft to aircraft. Um, that's something we have to see how far this will be possible. Because that's also depending on the multi-crew functionality and the multiplayer itself. Roger, I know something K50, K50 can do that or something. But yeah, I'm pretty sure K50 can send target information over. I never use it because... To each other. Yeah, to each other and not to not over the Link 16 or anything, but yeah. Wow. So, um, but um, Link 16 is something that is only used by the Air Force. Mm. The Army has a different system. Um, they can interoperate with the Air Force, yes, but the Army does not use Link 16 as such. Okay, well, we'll come to that in a second. Will the rocket pods have a mixed loads or just, I'm guessing the rocket pods won't have mixed loads? They do have mixed loads mm. already. So you mm. have an alpha layer and a bravo layer. Uh, alpha layer are the top two and the top bottom um two rockets and the Bravo layer are the three rockets in the middle um, so you can have mixed loads with the standard load um, laser guided will not be able to be mixed at the point uh, at the moment um, so you then have to have a full laser guided rocket pod right. um, yeah uh, other than that yeah you can choose and uh, you also have to uh, define inside of the um, weapons page um, which rockets you have loaded um, for example, if you don't designate or like tell the system that you have laser guided rockets now, um, it will not operate. It will just fly off uh, like a normal rocket and will not operate as a laser guided rocket itself. Mm. So you have to define which rockets you're using and which layer. Is that um, is there anything else in DCS as mixed rocket loads? I don't think there is. Is there? No. Okay. There's not yet. Very good, guys. Although there should be as far as the information is that I have. Right, so uh, will it have Link 16? No, by the sounds of things, and pass information onto the Hornet, the new 18C, and the F 16. Uh, so just no, as, 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 as what I hear. 
Mm, no, because at the moment um, the other modules would need to have the army version as well. Mm -hmm. If we want to do it proper, um, it's a different system they operate at. So um, Link 16 is not an option there um, for this combination. Modra, will you be modeling an IR jammer? What's an IR jammer, guys? Is it, what is it? The is IR jammer. Jam um, the IR jammer is that uh, the pilots call it disco ball uh, at the end, uh, at the bar, at the rear of the Kiowa, um, which was removed many years ago already. Um, so no, it's not going to be in there. Um, we just we, we talked to the team and we were like, okay, do we need the ALQ forty nine? I think it's called. Um, I would have to check the number though. Um, and uh, they were like, no, don't do it because uh, it was removed like in 2010, 2009 ish, right about. Um, so they're not using it for many years uh, anymore. And um, so, no. And it's it's not really needed. Um, I, I've tested the, the countermeasures already, um, how they're working uh, against IR missiles. And yeah, you will like it. Very good. Very good. Okay, guys, that's got. Oh, someone's adding a question in. Someone's adding a question in. Chaff and flares, question mark. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be there. Yeah, we'll be. Chaff in a helicopter. Mm -hmm. mm. How I cannot say how it works because uh, that is then crossing into the so-called um, restricted classified area, mm -hmm. but um, we received some information um, what is what the cartridges are capable of. Right. And uh, yeah, we we plan to have a, a unique uh, little thing inside of the aircraft um, that will be used to set that stuff. Because um, in general, this is set by uh, by crew chiefs before the mission. Roger, interesting. Okay, is someone writing in question eight? Is that is that an aerial behind the wire cutter above the cockpit? Mm -hmm. What is meant by that aerial? In the, uh, in the picture uh, on the spreadsheet, I don't know if they can see it. I see the spreadsheet, but um, there's a picture of the Kiowa and there's a wire cutter in the center of the, the yeah. cockpit canopy, yeah. and then behind that there's a vertical mm -hmm. mast of some sort. And I think they're asking, is that a? Oh yeah, like an antenna. Uh, that is actually an antenna. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we will uh, as soon. As, I'm pretty sure everyone in GR is going to be buying that Kiowa, so we're going to be flying around with it as soon as we can uh, get it and put it into missions and lasing and all, all of those sort of things. So we look forward to doing that. Um, and just uh, massive respect for putting you, you, yourself out there, guys, and, and letting us interview you. Anything you guys want to ask? I suppose. Is, uh... Uh, yeah, a little uh, little thing because I saw it on your videos mm. that you have issues with helicopters. That cap. Mm. Um, mm. There will be a part in the flight manual manual that we're creating um, mm. that will um, describe helicopter physics in a short brief way for i don't want to say dummies because i was yeah, i am uh, a dummy you, you can say <laughs> no, that all you like no 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 because i can tell you having been with the pilots um and now really i did study helicopter dynamics with them and their help for roughly two years and there's still sometimes topics inside of a helicopter where neither the pilots can explain why a helicopter is doing that um, but there will be a part f um, that will briefly describe all the facts, um, what they're doing in the real aircraft, and you will be able to feel them in the aircraft, as, in, in the DCS aircraft as well. So um, I would recommend anybody who um, even is used to the Huey or MI8, Gazelle, K50, take the time, read that part, try to understand what's written there or what is shown in pictures and short descriptions, and um, give yourself time to understand the flight model of the Kiowa. Um, as the streamer said, it's next generation for them. Um, they needed time as well to understand why the helicopter is doing certain things. Um, even a turn, um, why you drop um, altitude um, without uh, when you're not increasing your um, pitch. Um, and uh, so it will all be explained there in a short way. Um, my suggestion is um, if you jump into the helicopter, take your time learning the takeoff and the hover um, and start out with slow flights uh, and give yourself some time. Don't expect to be perfect on the Kiowa from the first minute on if you're not used to it or if you're not a rear pilot that knows everything about this aircraft uh, or like how to fly a rear aircraft. Roger. Well, it's taken five years. Uh, I have another question. Sorry, go ahead, Arnold. Um, well, it hasn't come up yet, but um, obviously in the Gazelle, when you're targeting, for example, with the Hot 3, 
you know, there's an autopilot of, of sorts flying the aircraft. Can you mm -hmm. talk more about what's going to happen in the Kiowa? Yeah, Kiowa, basically, um, we um, integrated already a functioning AI pilot. Um, and one of the videos I saw on Hogget that were people complaining like, yeah, look at this crappy flight model. It's super stable and so on and so on. Um, the point is, while we did that, um, if you're operating the system on the MFD and you're doing all the stuff you have to do, search, set your missiles, set your laser codes, maybe even in, um, putting in a target into your target list and so on and so on. Um, if you're operating the system through the MFD, um, you will be occupied mentally a lot by the system itself. Um, and um, if you're not paying attention to the aircraft, what it's doing while you're operating it, um, it in DCS would kill you uh, mm -hmm. and in real life as well. And uh, I've tried it, I've practiced it, yes, but even after roughly 600 to 700 test hours now in this aircraft and the build that we have, um, even I cannot manage a perfect hover while operating the systems. Um, and uh, so the AI pilot is capable of flying the aircraft properly, um, and it will also be able to um, fly the routes it will be able to operate um, as in hover in forward flight uh, or in general um, flight functions and um, it will also be able to fly a certain combat eight that's what the pilots call it um, which is an observing uh, maneuver where they fly kind of like a flat eight have the MMS pointing into target direction and staying off the the, the actual weapons range of the ground units and observe the area and then pick the targets and uh, prepare the attack run. So that's something that the pilot will be able to do as well. <laughs> In terms of the co-pilot, um, Patrick and I, we were discussing certain functions, um, how far we want to go with the co-pilot, what uh, the female co-pilot in this case right. um, will be able to do. So, um, yeah, and about um, that, um, there is no real uh, outer hover in, in the rear aircraft. So um, I, a supplementary question, because it is an issue in some of the helicopters that we have now, is because you've got no doors on it. I assume you have it, no doors on it. Um, can you stick your head outside? Um, in VR, I think, Danny. In VR, you can, can. yeah. Because one of the annoying things is you can't check behind the aircraft. Like in the Huey, you can if you get in the the like the like gunners, you can actually look out the door behind the, air, the aircraft, but you can't as, as a pilot. I know you can't really do that as a pilot either if there are doors on, but, you know, um, the other thing was um, when you're flying in the Huey, for example, um, you, you can't really see out the left side of the aircraft and you had a real co-pilot, you know, he would call out, someone's shooting at us, you know, <laughs> something like that. You, you can't, is, is there going to be anything like that from the AI? Um there is actually a system in the helicopter that will warn you of certain things in real. If you're, for example, attacked by a SAM, let's say a Stinger or an Igla, the system will warn you and will tell you where this missile comes from. Um, how far we will go in terms of that system, um, we are not yet certain if it will have all the real functions um, that it has as well in real life, because um, um, this is actually then crossing into a certain mm -hmm. area where mm -hmm. you don't necessarily want to cross into. Mm -hmm. Does it have an RWR? Yes. So basically what it has um, is um, three uh, systems. It has an RWR, um, which is an older version of an RWR. So it can um, actually see and identi identify SAM systems. Um, it cannot identify um, aircraft as such um, so it can just tell you that's an unknown um, so the the data the, the, the um, file the data file of the old RWR is not as uh, sophisticated as like in, in a TWS of an F-15 or stuff like that um, and um, for the the army was not necessary to know hey this is now an f-18 mm -hmm. that's an f-15 that's a 27 or whatever um for them it was more focused on the sam so um that's what it can do and it will do um there is then a so-called uh, laser detection um unit the amp whatever it's called um amp and i have to check the exact name um but the number is two 
um, that's also in the aircraft. Um, so it will tell you if a laser is lasing you as such uh, and will give you a warning, um, which is integrated into the uh, RWR. So these two systems operate together in a mix. And then there's also a CMWS, um, or the pilots call it uh, CMOS, um, which is actually an um, automated system, a countermeasure system that will also tell you certain things that are fired at you on the battlefield will be seen and the system will react to it. Um, yeah, at the moment it's reacting to uh, any kind of a uh, missile. So, um, yeah, so, and um it's very potent so if you what you described earlier was the gazelle um with that um heat signature where auntie was flying there and it's like a dozen or even more missiles were fired at him and he was able to dodge it as long as you don't point the engine exhaust mm. towards the target you have a very very high um probability of survival in this aircraft mm because um, the aircraft does have flares that are shot forward underneath the aircraft into the flight direction. Um, and um, as far as I've seen it, I would say out of roughly... It, it, there is not really a number where I could say this is set in stone, but between 10 to 20 uh, like infrared missiles can be fired at you until they mm. actually hit. As long as you keep the engine whole, the exhaust away from the target. Mm -hmm. Probably the biggest question is when is the release? When is the release? Yeah, well, uh, no, yeah, everyone wants everything now. I've, I've noticed that. Oh, everyone wants um, yeah, there's one thing that, might, that people might want to know Same. is I've seen one question that came up in the streams was about the f damage model. Mm -hmm. The damage model will be one of the last object parts that we will code. So um, we will try to implement a very sophisticated and detailed um, damage model with the help and information from the pilots. There will not be a rotor flying off like in the Huey. Mm -hmm. This is not happening, but there are certain other parts of the system, how you can damage the aircraft um, in certain ways. But um, so um, we try to integrate as much as we can. Um, I can just state that over 160 cautions and warnings are available in this aircraft and the rear aircraft that can be displayed on your MFD. Um, we will see how many of them we will use for DCS, what makes sense, what does not make sense. So there might be some failures that we will not integrate um, for the actual fact that it's not usable as such in DCS, or it's maybe a minor detail that might come up like once in 200 times. So investing certain resources of development into such a small detail um, it's just like a comparison doesn't make sense. Is the investment of development time verified for that? Yes or no. So, um, but major failures um, will be there. Um, and yeah, that's basically about the flight model. I had something else in my head right now that was came out, coming up in the streams, but I forgot about it. So. Well, John, um, when yeah. is the next live stream? Um, we have a certain time frame, but um, we have to check um, if the guys will be available, if we um, can make it, if everybody will be there. Um, so um, it will not be too far away. That's actually the plan. And uh, we also want to have some uh, other system parts finished for that. Um, so um, yeah, depending on that, we will determine the date. Cool. Great. To that. Right. In that case, I'm no, nothing to add then. I think we'll wrap it up, guys. Uh, much respect for you two coming. And we wish you all the best. Um, and we are fans. So um, that's about it, guys. Thank you very much for coming. And really good chat. Really good interview that was. So it's nice when guys open. And, you know, you can tell they're obviously just genuinely nice people as well, which makes it so much easier. Um, cool. All right, guys. Uh, well, we'll sign off there. Thank you very much. And we'll see you later. Polychop.